Good morning, Fountain of Life. Uh, we are glad that you are joining us here today on this Facebook Live broadcast. And I have an encouraging message for you today that I think will lift up your hearts and lift up your spirits. So I hope that you are ready for the word. And I hope that as Sam has been leading us in worship this morning, that you are not just sitting there kind of passively listening. Now, now don't get me wrong, Sam has a great voice and it's definitely worth listening to. But God is not looking for listeners. He's looking for worshipers, singers. You might think, well, I can't sing. Well, that's okay. You can make a joyful noise to the Lord. But uh, he's, the scripture says he's looking for worshipers. He's looking for those who would sing the songs of Zion even during a season like we are going through. I don't know if you realize this, but singing is very, a very spiritual activity. And I really believe in my spirit that the current situation that we are in demands a song of us as believers, a praise and worship to our God. Our faith in God, knowing who He is, knowing what He is able to do, the power that He has, it demands a song of praise and worship from our hearts. Because we are in a spiritual battle and fight, that demands that we use a song as a weapon and, and, and it demands that we sing to the Lord. And even the Word demands that we sing to Him. Uh, Paul even spoke about the necessity of song in our spiritual life. He, here are a couple of astounding facts as we kind of jump into this message today entitled, The Demand for a Song. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, he, he, he seemingly elevates singing almost to the same place as prayer. Now, everybody knows how important prayer is, but did you know singing is incredibly important as well? This is what he says, 1 Corinthians 14 and 15. He says, I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. He puts those two seemingly on the very same plane. And there is something that is very spiritual that takes place, my friend, in your life when you sing. It may be singing with your understanding or singing with your spirit, but it's important to our lives as believers. By the way, did you know that Christianity sings more than any other religion? Let me tell you the reason why. We've got something to sing about. Come on. Amen. And his name is Jesus. And then Paul also tells us that when we are filled with the Spirit, that the overflow of that will be singing. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. He tells us, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing aloud and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's telling us that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have sing and you're going to have a song in your heart. You know, there's a, a question that people ask, you know, from time to time. They say, do you sing because you're happy or are you happy because you sing? And uh, we could ask the question, am I filled with the Spirit because I sing and worship the Lord? Or do I sing and worship the Lord because I'm filled with the Spirit? And the answer to that is both of those things. To tell you the truth, everything that you do with your voice has an effect on you. If you complain, it's going to cause you to feel discouraged. If you're negative with your words and your thoughts, it will cause you to sink into a depression. If you speak words that cause a lot of stress, did you know that it can actually even weaken your immune system? And if you get angry and let out a rage and a blast of anger, you know what happens? It pumps adrenaline into your system. So what you do with your voice can bring victory or defeat. You can use your voice to moan and groan, or you can use your voice to sing and praise and worship. What comes out of your mouth affects your mood. It affects the very atmosphere that you dwell in. And did you know that 23 times in the book of Psalms, it tells us to sing praises to God? I love Psalms 9 and verse 2. It says this. He says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When's the last time without any music or instruments you just began to sing a song of praise to the Lord? I love Psalm 59. 
and 16. It says this, but I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. How many of you know his mercies are new every morning? And it goes on to say, for you have been my defense and in the day of my trouble. Let me tell you, everything that God has done for you and for me, even during this crisis, it demands a song of us. We ought to praise him and worship him that he spared us, that he's kept us safe, that he's kept us strong, that he's kept us with food on our table, and most of all, that he has been very present in our lives. Let me tell you, singing is spiritual business. A few years ago, my Beautiful wife, Jereen, went through a very difficult season in her life. She had a season where she had to have one eye surgery after the other, and it was very difficult on her. I don't even pretend to understand everything that she went through. She had five retinal detachments, three macular detachments, and after the surgery, due to the things, the, the oil and, and gas that they would put in her eyes, she literally had to sit with her head looking at the floor. And uh, you can imagine how that affected her back and her, and her neck, and she had many sleepless nights. And, and uh, she told me that during those nights that she determined that she was going to sing and worship the Lord and come into His presence. And so she would begin to worship Him and sing His presence and honor Him with her voice. And God, I believe, honored her during that time with His powerful presence in her life and gave her a wonderful testimony of healing. But, 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 but it was a difficult season. But I'll tell you something. Out of that season, Jereen came a woman who could not stop singing. She's got a song of joy and praise down in, in her heart and in her soul. So out of the deepest trial came a song of great praise. And that's why I think that she's so passionate when she leads us in worship here at Fountain of Life. But I, I honestly believe that in this, this season that we're in, God is looking for a song from His people. Because that song can turn our circumstances around. And so I've got a couple of questions for you today. The first question is this. Number one, will the circumstances of your life dictate the song that you sing? Powerful question. Psalms 137 brings to us a, power, a, a, a powerful meditation about this question. It is a psalm that really has its roots uh, stretching back into a difficult day in the lives of God's people. Now, we know from history that because of Israel and Judah's sin, God had allowed them to be defeated. And they, had, they were captured and they were actually, hundreds of them were taken away to Babylon. And you can imagine what they were feeling. Their beloved city of Jerusalem and their homes were destroyed. They had to leave all of that and, and, and their lands and their possessions. And they had been taken captive and taken to a strange land. They had seen many of their loved ones die. They were mourning the fate of their nation. And they were thinking about their own sin that had caused all of this. And so they finally get to Babylon, okay? And as they are there, perhaps in a prison camp along the Euphrates River, surrounded by willow trees growing by the river. They were weary from their journey. Their numbers greatly reduced, their hearts heavy. During that season, someone penned this psalm. Let me read it for you today, Psalms 137. It says this, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion... We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. In other words, they said, I don't think I can sing a song. For there were those who carried us away captive, asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse 4 says, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Now, now, that's a powerful picture for you and I to meditate upon. The very people who had captured them were now demanding a song. Sing us a happy song. And the people of God in that moment were questioning, do I even have a sad song to sing? What, what can I do? And so in that moment, the scripture says that they hung their harps 
on the willow tree. It's not really known whether some brave soul, you know, answered the demand and, 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 and the request. We don't know whether they sang the songs of Zion or broke out into some type of a happy song. Now, a few years back, Jerrine and I had the great privilege of going to Israel. And while we were there, in fact, at the, at the Wailing Wall, a, a group of young boys, I would say from about 15 to 17 years of age, teenagers, had gathered there. And they began to worship and they were singing a song. And it was fascinating to watch as these young men danced before their God with all of their might and worshipped Him and, and sang a song. And you could see the happy faces as they sang this song, I had no idea what they were singing, but I could see the gladness and the laughter that they had. And I cannot imagine the, uh, you know, uh, the captors in Babylon demanding that those in, who were in captive by the river Euphrates would now sing a song like that. These men and women in this psalm were in desperate circumstances. And I know that as this crisis perhaps deepens and as the coronavirus keeps us distant from one another, as the unemployment rate soars even higher. I mean, I just heard that there are now 26 million people on unemployment rolls. We've got to pray, church. But here's a question for you and for me. Will we hang our harps up on the willow tree? Will the song disappear from our lips? I pray not because, my friend, the circumstances of life don't get to dictate to you and me the level of praise that we have for God come on we can praise him and worship him in spite of any and every circumstance and difficulty in our life uh, it's found in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 and 18 a verse that I've loved for years it describes a very desperate moment in the life of this Old Testament prophet that desperate moment could not quench the prophet's praise. This is what he says. He says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Listen to what the prophet says. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Now wait a minute. Hold on for just a minute. This guy and his fellow neighbors are in desperate straits. There's not any fruit, no olive crop, no food, no flocks, no herds. But you know something? Nothing could stop his prayer. He was rejoicing in the Lord. He was praising God for who his God was. And I'm going to tell you the reason why, my friend. Because there is no situation that is so desperate that our God cannot intervene. Come on. He's the God of our salvation. He's, he's not just the, the God of spiritual salvation. He rescues us and saves us in many ways. And so Habakkuk was one who said, no, I am not hanging my harp up on the willow tree yet I'm going to praise him I'm going to rejoice in the God of my salvation I want you to know my friend that the size of our circumstances don't determine the size of our praise the size of our God determines the size of our praise and I've always loved the story of Paul and Silas Paul and Silas have been arrested for preaching the gospel they've been beaten they've been put in stocks and they're in the innermost part of the prison. And I want you to understand that the prisons of that day, man, they are nothing like the prisons of today. There was bugs and roaches and rats. And it was not that they had done something wrong. No, they had done something right. And what had happened to them was not even lawful. Paul was a Roman citizen and should have never been treated as he was. And I want you to understand that most of our circumstances that we are in today are really nothing like what Paul and Habakkuk and Silas and, and the group down there who had been captured in Babylon had to face. The truth is we're just a little bit inconvenienced. Oh, we can't go to a restaurant or, or you know, we have to stay at home. We can't take in a movie or whatever. And don't misunderstand me. I realize that some are, are maybe seriously worried about their future. But the truth is most of us are not in prison bleeding from an unjust beating. 
But Paul and Silas would not hang their harps on the tree either. They would not refuse to worship him because in Acts 16 and 15, this is what it says. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were doing two things. They were praying and singing hymns to God. Let me tell you something. If there's two words that ought to describe the church of the Lord Jesus Christ during this season, that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be praying and singing praises to our God. And it says this, that the prisoners were listening to them. And I love that verse because it tells us this. It tells us that the world is waiting to see if you and I have a song. It's waiting to see if we're going to hang our harps on the willow or we're going to praise Him. The prisoners were listening to them. Back beside the Euphrates rivers in Babylon, the captors were demanding a song of them. In Habakkuk's day, uh, they were, they were uh, wondering, how is Habakkuk going to respond to all of this? Will he give up in despair? All the people that he ministered to were wondering the answer to that question. And I want you to understand today, church, that as a believer, the world wants to know whether what we have is real or if it isn't. And, 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 and we sometimes think that it is in the high points of our lives when our families are blessed and, and that, 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 that we can show forth that. But let me tell you something. It is actually in the low points of life. It's through the difficult seasons. It's in the moment of hardship that when the song comes forth out of us, it shows the world that we have a real faith in a real God who really can rescue a real people from any disaster my friend when you have a shout in your shackles when you have a praise in your prison when you have a testimony before the test is even over when you can adore him even while you're going through adversity when you can glorify him at midnight in a prison covered in blood and in shackles my friend that's a praise that's going to enter right into the very throne room of God and that's a praise that's going to show everybody around who's listening what these people have is something that is real I can imagine that day. Paul says to Silas, you remember that song? And Silas says, what song? Paul begins to sing it out. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds the hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my Savior God I can imagine a hymn something like that echoing through that prison and everyone is listening and they're wondering how can these people who just been beaten how can they sing praises to God then they get to that other verse that says and when I think that God, His Son not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in that on a cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. And about that time, Silas lets out a big praise God. And they begin to worship and thank Him for all of His goodness. I'm just here to proclaim that our circumstances do not dictate the song in us. It is the Spirit of God that is alive and dwelling within us that rises up within us and in the midst of a hard time in the midst of a difficult moment that song rises up inside of us and we give a shout of praise to the Lord our song determines the atmosphere we live in in Acts 16 and verse 16 tells what happens it says suddenly oh suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loose. Listen, if you need a suddenly in your life, if you need an immediately in your life, then you need to praise Him no matter what situation you're in. You need to sing to Him. You need to worship Him. I tell you what, the choice is yours, my friend. Because the same God that shook the foundation of those prisons and Paul 
and Silas day it can shake up whatever's causing you trouble and God can get the glory hallelujah by the end of the day the Philippian jailer and his household were accepting Jesus why because they dared to lift up a song when it was demanded of them let me give you a second question today do you understand the significance of your praise I love some of the more modern worship songs. I love, this is how I fight my battles. Woo! I fight my battles with praise. I love that song from a few years ago that says, I will praise him in the storm. Why? Because he's right there with me in the storm. I like the song that we sing here at church. I will raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Do you realize that your praise is joining the millions across millennia who have chosen to worship the one true God? Our praise is important because it shows the enemy me whose side we are on every moment of every day you get to choose who and what you will worship we all know that there's a spiritual battle going on it is fought in the hearts and the minds of God's people and in in this battle we know that God is on one side and Satan is on the other and everyone knows that there's this battle going on between good and evil but how did it get started I want to take you back For a moment this morning, back even before the Garden of Eden, back into the eons of time. And I I want you to go back to that day when Satan fell from his position. Do you understand that the conflict of the ages was actually started over worship? One of the most fascinating areas to study and understand is where Satan came from and what it was that caused him to fall. Satan's original name was Lucifer. And I want you to recall that names have great significance in the spiritual world. And Lucifer literally means the light bearer, the brilliant one, the shining one. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 13, the scripture describes Lucifer in amazing ways. It says this, it says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. It says that Lucifer was adorned By every precious stone. Now, there are Bible scholars that believe that those precious stones were actually a part of his very being. And how many of you understand that what gives beauty to a precious stone is really the way that that stone reflects the light? A gemstone in darkness has no beauty but if you bring it into the light it it shows forth it it reflects the light in 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 a splendor a sway and underneath the earth today in the dark cavities are are gemstones that have been formed but there's no beauty in them because they sit in the darkness but if they were to be brought up out of the earth and and they were to be properly cut and they would be brought into the light they would be brilliant and my friend that was Lucifer's role as he was in the very presence of God he literally was a reflector of that light now how many of you remember that the scripture tells us that God is light and so Lucifer literally was a reflector of the light of God in the presence of God in the presence of the light his gems reflected God's splendor and Lucifer in that moment became what his name was called he became the light the brilliant one, the shining one. When you read the book of Revelation, we see that the throne room of God was made up, is made up of a great deal of worship. Beings are falling down before Him. Crowns are being cast before the Lamb. Audible praise is being spoken. There are seraphim that are crying continually, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. A lot of verbiage that is spoken that reflects the splendor of God's supremacy, not just in in words, but in song and in music as choirs of celestial angels sing the praises of God. 
Handel's Messiah with all of its beauty of harmonies and counter-harmonies is not majestic enough for us to sing in the presence of a God so mighty. Only a heavenly song with rhythms and counter-melodies sung and played on instruments we don't even know about can adequately reflect the glory that's due His name. And there are many that believe that Lucifer himself was a pipe organ. Some even believe him to have been in a sense heaven's praise and worship leader. J. Dwight Pentecost, a great scholar, describes him in his book, The Devil, Your Adversary, like this. He says, it was not necessary for Lucifer to learn to play a musical instrument in order to praise God. If you please, he had a built-in pipe organ, or he was an organ. That's what the prophet meant when he said, the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day. You were created. No other created being could so beautifully reflect the light and play the songs worthy of God as did Lucifer. And what we know is that Lucifer one day, into his mind came, he decided one day that he wanted the praise and the glory for himself. He decided that he would no longer be content to be a reflector. He would activate his will and he would ascend to become God. Isaiah 14 tells us the five I wills of Satan. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And he even says this, I will be like the most high, high God. There's a reason why he said that. It's because he wanted worship. And because of that, he was cast out of heaven. We know that. He took a third of the angels with him. He did that because he wanted to pray for himself. He wanted to be worshipped himself. He was tired of being a reflector of worship. He wanted to be worshipped. And you see, my friend, today, you and I are in a spiritual battle. And we have spiritual weapons. And the battle began, began a long time ago when our chief adversary, Satan, the devil, that roaring lion, when he wanted the praise and worship that was meant for God alone. You see, Satan wants to stop all worship of God. And the enemy thinks, I believe in this season, that when the church is away from congregating together, that somehow the praise and the worship is going to diminish. But I've got news for the enemy. Come on. I, I can see in living rooms and in automobiles and in cars as people pray and as they worship and they sing praises to God that it has not reduced the amount of praise and worship. It has actually augmented the amount of praise and worship that's going to heaven. Amen. Why? Because we're discovering that He is the only one that's worthy to be praised. And that never changed. I wish we could understand how important worship is. And I'll tell you, Satan will do anything he can. He will try to get you to stop worshiping. He'll use every excuse in the book. He'll throw difficulties at you. Problems in the family. Problems with your wife. Problems in your marriage. But I'm going to tell you something. Worship Him anyway. Pray him anyway. Give him glory anyway. Don't let anything stop the song that needs to come out of your heart. The struggle of over worship will culminate, my friend, at the end of the age. We've been studying here at Fountain of Life on Wednesday nights, some parts of the end times. And there's a period known as the tribulation period where Satan will once again attempt to sit in God's place. If he can't receive worship in heaven, he's going to try his best to receive it here on earth. We know sometime in the distant future in a newly built temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, there'll be an event that takes place that will cause God's wrath to be poured, about, to, uh, poured out. Second Thessalonians tells us that the Antichrist, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the man doomed to destruction, I, I believe that it is literally a man who is possessed by Satan himself. He will attempt to take a place of worship that rightly belongs to Jesus Christ. And here's what the Word says, Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 4. It says this, He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself 
himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. He will make an image of himself that will come to life for the all for the purpose of deceiving the world. He will proclaim himself as God and he does this for just one reason. He wants the worship that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. So how many of you are getting the picture this morning? Satan wants to be worshipped. There's been a war uh, over worship throughout the eons of time. Did you ever stop to think, why will every knee bow? Why will every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord through the glory of God the Father? I'll tell you why. It's because Jesus is the only one who can rightfully receive the worship and the adoration. And I declare the only one in the universe who's worthy of our worship. I'll tell you, it's not the latest rock star or the latest Hollywood diva. It's not about fame or human governments. I'll tell you, it's about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That first commandment says, you will have no other gods before me. We are to worship Him alone. And so whether you see it or not, whether you're conscious in your conscious mind, you are aware of it or not, that's not important. You're in the middle of a war about worship. And that's why in this season my friend let's be sure in our homes in our cars on our uh, as we listen to YouTube whatever it is amen lift up a song of praise amen to the king of kings and the lord of lords that's why the great challenge is for believers to honor him amen I love this scripture and I want to close with this this morning Hebrews 13 and verse 15 says this Therefore, by him, let us continually, oh, we should continually offer him praise. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. I want you to make up your mind today as we live through these last days that are the beginning of sorrows in our world and as we think about all that is happening we need to make a decision that you and I that we're going to be a people of praise and worship and that we you know we won't have to have a song demanded of us but that we will freely and liberally and easily give a song of praise to our Lord it says the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name I don't know about you, but I'm thankful today. I'm thankful for all that he has done in my life, in my home, and in my family. And I'm here today to tell you that I want to give him a song of praise and of worship. I want to pray with you today. Would you join with me? Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone who's listening to this message today. God, I pray, Lord, for those who may be feeling isolated, alone, at home, feeling discouraged, feeling worried, wondering about all that's happening in the future. Lord, I pray that from down on the inside of them would rise a song of worship and praise and adoration to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I pray, God, that you would surprise us as you did Paul and Silas with a suddenly and an instantly. God, that you would reach your hand down, God, and, 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 and intervene in the lives of your people. Lord, every need that people have today, let it be met in the name of Jesus out of your power and out of your greatness. And Lord, may you, re- may you receive in your ears and in your nostrils, Lord, a sweet song of praise that's lifted up before you today by the people of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today. I've got good news for you today. The scripture says this, he can turn your mourning into dancing. For the ashes of your life, he can bring beauty. And the best thing is, he can put a good song down inside of your heart so that you'll have a praise and a worship to the Lord. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, there's some things you need to do today. First of all, you need to recognize that you're a sinner, that you've failed the Lord. The scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I want to encourage you to think about the things in your life that have separated you from the Lord, those sinful ways, that wanting to do life on your own. And then the next thing you need to do is you need to believe in Him. The Scripture says that if we confess with our mouth 
and believe in our heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. If we confess that He is Lord, if we confess that He's our Savior, if we believe in our heart that He's been risen from the dead, that we will be saved. You need to trust in Him. Put all your hope in Him. Let me tell you, if there's not enough good deeds that you can do to be saved, you can't first clean up your life and then come to the Lord. You need to come to Him just as you are. And if you'll do that, He will love you and He will accept you. And the first thing He'll do is He'll take the heaviness out and put a song of praise and joy in your heart. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me today. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you, God. I realize that I am a sinner, that I've strayed away, that I have failed the Lord. I have done what I thought was right, and I've missed the mark. I've failed, and I've sinned. And today, I confess those sins to you today. And I ask for you to forgive me of those sins. And today, with my mouth, I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in my heart, I believe that He was raised from the dead on Easter Sunday and that He lives still. And today, I believe in Him. And I make a determination in my mind to repent from dead works and to turn to the living God and to find Him as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord, as my forgiver and as a director of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that, I want to encourage you to instant message me. I'd love to pray with you in person or lead you in prayer. Listen, we love you. We're glad that you joined us on this broadcast. And we know that God has great things in store for you. Amen. Amen. Would you take this afternoon, sometime today, and find a place just to worship Him again. Maybe you want to just replay this, have a watch party, and this time as Sam uh, sings those songs, be right there in front of your computer screen or right there by your phone and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen, because He's worthy of that today. Listen, we love each and every one of you. Hold on for just a moment. We're going to have an announcement for you and, uh, and uh, just, just some more information that we want to give our church family today. So I'll be back with you in just a moment. God bless.